That's quite large too, yeah. It is a very large black coral. At least it looks, yeah, that's a black coral. Dave, they're asking if you were involved in bringing the live dive video to the Exploratorium in those early days. They said they have a faint memory of a temporary exhibit there that showed live video from a deep sea expedition. Uh, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, I'm thinking. They don't um, say, but... Yes, uh, probably. I, that, that was before my time, I think, uh, though we did, uh, we docked at the Exploratorium uh, several seasons running, yeah, uh, and we uh, we've done often we've done uh, uh, both uh, just live feeds and interactions to museums, aquariums, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's quite possible I was involved, or uh, someone just like me. One of our viewers commented in for us that it looks like we're going over shale rock, and that I think Larry was describing shale as a metamorphic rock. So that is what's giving this white colored surface that we're now seeing. I was in Honolulu uh, a few years ago on vacation with my wife uh, before I joined Nautilus. Uh, but actually before I, I was, we were in the, in the islands and then I was going to go aboard Nautilus at the end of our vacation. Uh, and we were at the uh, Honolulu Aquarium uh, down, by, uh, down by the zoo. It's a cute yeah. little aquarium. It is a cute little aquarium. I love aquariums. Wow. Yes. Uh, both my wife and I do, and so we decided to go check it out. Uh, and as we uh, walked into the uh, entryway, uh, just past the ticket booth, they had a large monitor on a stand sitting there, and there was the live stream from from Nautilus. Oh, they and, actually uh, had a Nautilus, like an animal Nautilus oh, there for a bit. Last yeah. time I went, though, I don't think they had it anymore, Can sadly. So my wife and I walked in and she said, it follows you wherever you go. Looks <laughs> like there's a little octopus crawling oh, yeah. on the sand there. Octopus right there. Oh. Down on the left of the big rock crawling yeah. along. And yep. there's also a really oh. abundance of coral on this rock. Yeah, this rock to look is, at. yeah. Uh, the ship has just now stopped up. I think we'll have um, we could Some honestly time to explore here and take I don't a know if it's thing. possible to circle this rock and map it even. This is a this is quite a bit of coral diversity on it. Do you think that yeah, octopus is oct gonna try and get that fish? How cool would that be? I don't know. It's more likely trying to get away from us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a lounge that would be a great candidate to model around. The voice of God has spoken. Yeah, once <laughs> um I think the triclops is being power cycled right now, but Get the octopus while Simon, we do that. when you're when you're comfortable, let's zoom in on the octopus. Yeah. Wow. It's another fish up there. Wow. Really. This is a. Yeah. You take what you can get down here and share it. I guess. It's quite the diverse little structure. Ship is all stop. Uh, no more swing. I don't anticipate. So I think we'll be here. Octopus is gonna run and hide. Yeah, the octopus went right under that little nook in the rock. It didn't want a close up. No. So we have another comment in the chat that they said the viewer brought up the shale, but they um, they are scientists on shore and they say that the shale doesn't make sense for this location. And someone else said shale is a sedimentary rock. It's one of the mudstones. If thin bedded, it is shale. If it's thick and more massive, then it's mudstone or claystone. So I think because this is really thick, they're saying it is more of a mudstone. I was wondering shit. with the geological activity, if there's any geologists can verify if, if we get hydromethane um, seeps, we get the formation of these rocks also, uh, the limestone interacting with the silt. Mm -hmm. I would think in this area it would be carbonate from yeah. uh, coral reefs, if I'm not. Mm -hmm. That could be part of it as well. That's true. 
Maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah, so for our viewers at home, our current depth is 410 meters. So this is quite a bit shallower than we are usually dive with Nautilus. So kind of a fun change in pace. So right now we're just getting cameras set up. Uh, once the cameras are done, do you want to take a complete swing around, uh, yeah. moving at a nice clip? Yeah, copy that. I'll get um, oh, wow. in a position where I can do it in one pass, so I'll come halfway around, and then I can come all the way around counterclockwise. And uh, yeah, should be all right. I'll let you know when uh, cameras are up. Thanks. Roger that. Yeah, look at that diversity just right there in that patch. That top corner right yeah. there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Quite a few different species of coral there. Yeah. Zach, what do you think? Yeah, there's a couple for sure. Which ones? There's what kind of species do you see? I don't know. I think the ones are black still. Um, I'm not sure on the other ones. Maybe we can ID them in the model later if we can't see them now. That's one of the nice um, things about this model too, right? It gives us these yeah. 3D render if it's something that us here in the control van don't know, we can make this model and view it later and kind of help us see those taxonomy differences that we can key out later on. Yeah. And if you look in like the right of the Herc screen, you see all the little things swimming to it. That's that's lightly um, zooplankton. They're often attracted to lights and they will swim um, right to it. So, and then things like aquaculture aquariums where they need to, you know, scoop quite a bit out of a tank. That's, that's kind of a cheat you can do. You put a flashlight at the top and they'll all swim right up to it. Um, that's what we're seeing is quite a plankton field here. That's one of my favorite things to do on night dives is to feed oh, yeah. the corals. So yeah. you take a flashlight, all the zooplankton, kind of like your moths to a light, fly to your flashlight, and then you hold the flashlight just right above the corals and you can see the corals actually suck up all that zooplankton. Yeah. Wow. Looks like there's a little crab or lobster in there too, even. Hiding in those corals. So one of the viewers is asking if it's actually a gigantic dead sponge. So I don't know if you're thinking the whole rock is a gigantic dead sponge. I don't think the whole rock is. I can see where you might get that idea because of how porous it is. But that would be a very gigantic sponge. Yeah. Do you have triclops up and running again? Or is we have one viewer who is saying they're at the Big Island a few weeks ago and was dying to catch a glimpse of the Nautilus, but never did. We were not around the Big Island a few weeks ago. We're a few weeks ago. We're kind of um, out. I think in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So. But currently, we're off the coast of Kona, so I could see one of my favorite Big Island beaches from from the ship. So that has been fun. I'm just overhearing them here in the back. It sounds like the triclops isn't responding right now. Um, so if you guys want to, we could zoom in while we we hang out and see. Maybe yeah, it'd be nice to ID some of these things. Uh, yeah. So one of our viewers, I think this is our one of our geologist viewers, is saying that there was a video showing spillage of um, deposition. Ergo, this is a carbonate geological um, deposition. This geological feature shows such amazing details. Uh, so uh, front row triclops is still down. So if we want to continue, if we want to continue on. That's that's perfectly fine. It's going to take them a few minutes to fix it. Okay, do we want to have any zooms in on anything? Do you want to zoom yeah, first? I think we should. Sorry, what was that about triclops? Where? 
It's still down. So okay, it's yeah. So, take a while. so if you want to uh, continue forward into finding. Yeah, that sounds good. We can get some IDs on stuff. So, Simon, the usual thing that we do is that uh, we'll, we'll center up on something that science identifies that they want to look at. You you walk in as close as you're comfortable with, and then I'll continue uh, and zoom in. Yeah, I'll uh, that. And you hold as stable as you can while I zoom in, and then uh, we'll, we'll back up a little bit and then repeat it, uh, depending on what we see. Oh, that's oh, a there's large fish coming yeah. in back there, too. And then it look like a eel, too, yeah. the white. Oh, is, is that a bomb And the chart? zoom is your call. When you're comfortable with okay. your position, then you call. Yeah, I'm holding so as... Uh, that might as be... As I can here, you can zoom in at your will. Nice and easy. So then, when I zoom, I usually come in about halfway. <laughs> uh, adjust my focus wow. as I can, and uh, they're uh, collecting stills. I, I imagine you're doing stills back there? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank they'll get you. stills. Uh, for identification, that kind of stuff, and then I'll uh, sit here for a little bit in a medium shot, then I'll zoom in for a close-up, and you can position the uh, ROV as you will, and there's a squat lobster oh, in squat there. Lobster. There we go, look at that. Oh wow. wait, are we supposed to do squats? Is that the thing now? <laughs> uh, that was <laughs> nah, a couple, last couple of <laughs> cruises ago, we uh, had people that were well, we had a squat lobster specialist, uh, <laughs> and she was yeah. collecting samples of these. Wow. How's that? I love the view of the squat lobster against that coral right there. Yeah, this is beautiful. It uh, looks like precious coral at the bottom, the stony stony coral of some kind. Primnoids, the, the mm. white, white one looks like primnoid. Okay. Uh, giant mushroom coral that that uh, to the to the left that red that red one looks look to me at least to my eyes but I'm not again as we get shallower I'm less and less familiar. Yeah, uh, I was zooming on that mushroom coral, Dave. And yeah, uh, copy that. Yeah, it looks to me like. Uh, I really I don't know. Yeah. Uh, oh. There you go. Mushroom corals are kind of fun for the fact that they're one giant polyp. Is that from what I've heard of mushroom corals? But is that a mushroom coral? Mm. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very a fast great zoom. Today. Awesome. Thank you. That is great. Are those um, so the yellow ones that could be those are look like zoanthids that are colonizing an old coral skeleton. Oh. Uh -huh. I think that's what's happening there. That's not a co that's not coral. Those are zoanthids. The yellow one on the left. Um, unless Zach tells me. Otherwise. No, no, Taylor Ann actually uh, showed me that in the beginning <laughs> because I got excited when, I, when we were going through the ID books first. Yeah, you can see the out. actual real coral polyps to the left yeah. that are. Um, and these zoanthids have kind of started to choke it out. Yeah. It's a bamboo coral. Originally, you can see the, oh, yep. the banding there at the base yeah. uh, where it gets its namesake. So, fun fact about zoanthids is that um, you can get them shallower, too, and that they can they release a poison toxin. And so um, ancient Hawaiians used to, like, take their arrows and, and dip them in the zoanthas and kind of rub them around to make poison darts. You know, I'm not usually uh, one that admires rocks very much, but uh, this is a beautiful rock. If that octopus will crawl back out for us. <laughs> hey, if Triclops is still down, let's get, spin around this rock and then uh, get moving on. We can use the Zeus footage for the model. Uh, copy. Do you copy that, Simon? I did. Roger. I wasn't sure if he was on uh, SPL. Yeah, we'll keep... Uh, I'll swing back around. And so I'll just stay wide. Uh, see if they can get some photogrammetry of this.
So our viewers say we only have to do squats if we're not in the van. So all of you watching in the lounge should be doing your squats for that squat <laughs> lobster. And you at home too, I think, should do squats. All right, moving back on, on the, heading towards the next waypoint. Roger, we'll step, if you're all right with that. Bridge, bridge nav. Uh, one step, three zero meters, bearing zero seven five. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, so these squares are currently 10 meters. Roger that. So the chat is asking what everyone's fa favorite, do you prefer aquarium or a zoo? I have to say I prefer aquarium. I feel almost a little bad depending on the zoo, but I think fish and things like that, I love seeing the fish diversity and I, I don't know, I don't feel as bad seeing fish in an aquarium as I do, like a lion at a zoo. That's a tough one. Yeah. You know, because they're just different species. Yeah. And there's some really incredible zoos out there and some amazing aquariums, too. Zach, what do you prefer, aquarium or zoo? If you have, to, if you have to give one up for the rest of your life, yeah. you can only go to one. Yeah, this is a, a tough question for me. I, you know, I've gone back and forth on this for a while. Um, but I actually grew up in Nebraska, so the zoo is, like, something that really, like, got me excited about marine science. I did an internship there at the... Um, Henry Dorothy Zoo for a while um, and you know that was something I always like I love going to um, I think the important thing about zoos is like um, in terms of like supporting them and whatnot is is a lot of them um, are actually like rescue facilities and rehabilitation yes. facilities right and um, yeah if, if you you know do some research and see what they're doing and that's even more fun sometimes to go and see you know like the projects they have going on there because a lot of the time it's, um, it's not just you know housing an animal um, Sorry, but uh, I can't speak for every zoo but yeah I mean Back home, the zoo, it was a zoo and an aquarium. So, you know, it's kind yeah. of best of both worlds. And I tend to be indecisive at times. So, yeah. And I think zoos and aquarium are really important, too, as an educational tool for um, kids and people. Get to see these things and hopefully, you know, care about something that even though it's not in your backyard. Yeah. But it is a tough line. TJ, what's your favorite? What would you give up if you could only go or zoo or aquarium? What's your favorite? Um, I would have to go for, I'd, uh, I'd give up the zoo. I'd, uh, I'd definitely be a fan of aquariums. Yeah. Um, in, my <laughs> in my youth, uh, I worked, uh, I spent a bit of time working in one, a uh, small one back home. Actually, it's a, another quite nice aquarium. If ever, anybody ever gets a chance to visit it. But yeah, um, I have plenty of animals at home in the farm, so. Uh, definitely, aquarium would be the the one I'd uh, choose to. What What's your favorite farm animal then? Oh, uh, well, we keep we keep horses and cattle, sheep. Um, I, see I, what that white, to, that white cool. cluster is. There. Um, quite fond of them all. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Green, we, uh, yeah, green pedigree, well, we might so have the reach. Uh, they're all very important to us. I've been really l liking the mini. Um, long-haired, like, uh, long-haired cows. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been looking recently at miniature highland cattle. Yeah, highland the, cattle, that's it. I think they're the, the most uh, amazing, the cutest uh, creatures you can find. <laughs> I, I really want one. I'm kind of thinking of maybe not getting a dog and trying to get a mini highland cow. Yeah. So if anyone yeah. knows how to get a mini highland cow over on Oahu, let me know. Well, if anybody knows how to get one over to Ireland, uh, <laughs> I'd definitely be interested in that. Yeah. But, uh, no, we keep, we keep shorthorns, pedigree shorthorns. Um, absolutely beautiful animals. Uh, every one of them has a name. Uh, they're as, uh, as tame and as uh, friendly as you could get. Um, my wife and kids are at home. They, ma they manage the farm uh, when I'm out here working. So. Um, all the all the animals they get uh, they're up on Instagram nearly every day, uh, getting some kind of scratch or rub. Yeah. For me, if you are interested, I'd definitely give up the zoo. I feel that we can 
as humans can travel on land if we really want to see exotic animals and yeah. however we very few of us get the opportunity to look into the ocean and see the uh, aquatic life i feel that's uh I couldn't Less quite tell what that was there. Yeah. We'll have to... Next time, uh, Dave's busy right now, so next time we'll... Yeah. Try to is, see. Uh, is the Norbit app active? Uh, yes. Okay. It it's is. out on uh, sat feed 3 right now since uh, Triclops is... Uh, okay, yeah, roger that. Work in progress. Um, got another kind of carbonate boulder here. Seems to be some of the white uh, white coral with the uh, ophiroid associate on it. Um, mm. And then it looks like there's some black coral on top. I don't know what the white, what type of the coral the white is. Maybe it's that precious coral again. But I'm fully caveat, not a biologist, just I think you are. <laughs> I think Not you've been all. doing this long enough that you uh -huh. you could call yourself that. <laughs> really interesting form. Yeah, I think with as many dives as you have, Rennie, that uh, you've probably got more knowledge than many people who have studied it for a yeah. couple of years. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think this is much better experience than just I seeing it. I don't it know yourself. anything about the animals themselves. <laughs> or I know very little, I should say, about the animals. <laughs> more, more about trying to identify their basic category there. but. Oh, that's really interesting structure of that rock. Yeah, it is. It's like a how hill. smooth it is on one side and Yeah. How bizarre. We have a viewer from Minnesota that sounds like they have a really cool aquarium at home. And we have another viewer saying they really appreciate all aquarium owners. It's so pretty to be um, a steward of the ocean based life. And I agree. In my classroom, I have um, a fish tank, and I also have uh, with guppies that we use for eco columns. No fish have been harmed, I promise. <laughs> and we also have an axolotl. Oh. But I remember growing up when I lived in Hawaii as a kid, me and my dad would have yeah. a saltwater aquarium, and we would get the fish, dive at night, grab the fish, put them in our tank, and um, it was a lot of fun learning how to take care of a saltwater tank as a kid. Some more of those uh, zoanthids uh, colonizing a um, a bamboo coral. Yes. I really love that bright yellow color of those uh, zoanthids. So, uh, I think that's what's happening on the bottom one, and the one above it is actually maybe a yellow uh, coral. I don't yeah, know. I don't yeah, know I the type. That is. Uh, is that a, a is that in the bubblegum coral family? Even though it's, or is it? I don't know. Oh, sure. Looks like there's a bamboo Paragorgia coral bottom maybe? left too. Front row, can we power sure uh, Can we power down the uh, cyclops? So for our viewers at home, you'll hear a couple different voices on here. Some of us are switching Sorry, out just for a little bit to go grab some dinner, and we will be back with you shortly. Oh. Some nice corals up on the top of that rock too. It's a it's a large one. Wow. Uh, Dan, we have a ship move in. We have twenty meters left remaining. We are going zero seven five bearing. Roger zero seven five. Uh, the slope has flattened out. We just have a few kind of chunky boulders as we go, as you can see in Atalanta. And um, Jonathan, you want to wait here? Um, I think so. We were troubleshooting around a uh, as a power cycle of triclops and kind of getting some opportunistic zooms here. Um, but now that we're getting into some better coral, yeah, I'll leave that to the.
keep it off for 10 minutes. We got a question coming in from online. Is it hard to sleep on the ship? Uh, stand by just one on that on that question there. Okay. Um, sorry, what was it you're saying about the, the Zeus? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah, sorry. Zoom out. Video, zoom out. All the way out? Like that? Sure. Okay. Roger. Roger, we'll continue. Um, we're starting to get up to the final lip on wow. the edge of this uh, shelf here, so we'll be up in the flatter part pretty soon. Are we going to run with the vignetting in the corners of, of the Zeus camera? Uh -huh. Usually we push in past that. Just you can leave it out. All right. That's beautiful coral. Wow. Ship move is complete. I'll just hold here for a little as you explore this little region. Yeah. Do we have the down lights on? No. Oh, it's just me. Turn it up. Hey, Randy. Yes. What's 65,000 divided by 24? Two seven zero eight. Two seven zero eight. What's two seven zero eight divided by 60? 45. What do you got? <laughs> <coughs> what this is costing us to sit here and Sorry, what was that?
There's a Paragorgia coral here in front of us. Uh, looks like that fan shape has really kind of taken advantage of all the direction of, it's really kind of like a cluster almost now. You can see those arms are kind of fanning out in different directions. Cool. Call this zoom the uh, Cormany special. It's uh, quite spectacular. We can see the capabilities of our, even just our main HD Zeus camera. So what, Dan? Zoom in? Oh, we got a polyp zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Love a good polyp zoom. Focus. Focus challenge. Focus, yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. I got that. Beautiful work. Okay, Dan, when you're when you're done with this beautiful polyp zoom, <laughs> um, we'd like to pull back and continue to move uphill again at, at all due haste, with all due haste. Will um, do. And uh, Jonathan will keep uh, recording with uh, with Zeus and trying to get photogrammetry that way. But uh, he's looking for a more dense uh, occurrence. So I'd like to just keep moving uphill. We don't have that much further uphill to go, but let's, let's get to the top and make a decision there. Roger, I will uh, make a ship move if you're all right with that. Or you want to hold on when you're right under? OK. Bridge now. Hey, Oriel, three zero meter step bearing zero seven five. Well, these are starting to be. Thank you. I'm not drawing my DVL track anymore. I don't know why. USBL's been good enough, but it's kind of annoying. Oh. I switched it back to t uh, to dead rec. I, 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 it looks like you guys were using USBL for a bit. Yeah, I switched it over. When I came on, it was in USBL, and now it's in dead rec but it's not drawing a track, which is, yeah. Yeah, we got to some flatter stuff and I went, went back. But I don't know why it's not drawing a track. Ship's on the move, point three. We have a question about why are the corals yellow? Ugh. Yeah, why is anything anything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's not a good <laughs> I, uh, uh, Yeah, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a lot of instances where uh, corals are get their coloration from when they're shallow a shallower water coral and then when they uh, evolve into deeper water coral uh, that some they maintain some of that color but the coloration at, at some of the depths is less important is there a biologist there to correct me in the background no i mean everybody actually looked at me and i'll be honest i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie about this one i yeah kind of anything in yeah. the deep sea that has a color that is, is a little less necessary but yeah, I mean, and out here in Hawaii, we, we have a lot of kind of the yellows and reds corals. Um, a lot of them are hard corals, too. Um, but why they are, 
I, I don't know that. It's a great question. It's a nice carbonate feature here. Yeah, it's beautiful rocks. So. See lots of guys hiding in the holes? Yeah. We had an octopus earlier. Oh, really? And we missed it. That was too quick. Crawled away before oh, we could see it. Probably many more. Yeah. <laughs> lots of little holes. Well, it's wonderful shelter for them. It's interesting structure because it reminds me of like up on the near shore where the rock boring urchins will dig in and dig those paths and yep. holes. But down here, it's just, is it is it just naturally forming that way or? Ship move is complete. Um, I can continue on. Continue on. Roger. Fast as you can go. Bridge nav. 10 meters minute. Yeah, we'll step another 30 meters bearing 070. Thank you. Hey Dan, are you uh, are you relief for Pete? Is Pete on now? Uh, I'm relief for Simon. Our relief for Simon, sorry. Yeah, didn't really. Oh, orange. Yeah, some orange and red there. Some type of goosefish. What is it? Is it a fish? Yeah, well, do you like yeah. an opportunistic zoom? Yes, you sure. may. Oh. 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 He's an orange gulper. Pu push in just a little bit for us, Dave. Oh. Uh, that should do us things. He's got feet. <laughs> He's so pretty. Looks more like a frog. <laughs> Got a little shrimp in the hole right behind him too, poking out of the hole. Haven't seen that color yet, have we? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Watch out for that rock. Oh, oh. oh. oh dear. there's another rock. Shining so much light on him, we blinded him. Yeah. He'll be blind for the next decade. Look at him wiggle his little butt. <laughs> You can really see how he uses those modified pectoral fins to grab on, huh? Let's see if I can get a beauty shot here if he doesn't fly away. No, he's a shy one. Yeah, poor guy, let him go. Bonk. Time to go anyway, your 60 seconds are up. Adelanta never stops. At least while the ship's moving. I'm afraid to ask, but do we know what kind of fish it is? I think some type of goose fish. I'm trying to get the species right now. But yeah, very similar to the ones we've been seeing on this um, expedition. But getting a little more color now. But still, you know, those reds, which, which aren't really visible. But... Oh, we got, looks, sounds like we got uh, Tori Hunt's uh, student online. Yes, we know Miss Hunt.
Yeah, so it looks like that one was the uh, Chonix penicillatus. Uh, the red and yellow goosefish we just had. Cool, yeah. thanks. Dan, I'll keep us moving at uh, maybe another three zero meters at seven zero seven zero. Yep, keep us moving. Great. Looking for sponges, corals, and rocks. Bridge, bridge, nav three zero at zero seven zero, please. Thank you. There, it's like zero sonar targets for the foreseeable future. There might be a little hint of one 40 meters out, but probably just another one of these little steps. All right, Dan, can you give me some power? Power, roger. Power to the track clubs. So we're nearing the top, I think, at this point. There's only yeah. a couple, you know, we're now at 383 meters. So we're very near the top. This is where we expect to see lots of corals and sponges and biodiversity. I'm seeing a lot of good carbonate. Yes. <laughs> we've had a couple of good mounds of coral here and there. Yeah. There's nice black fields. corals. Do we have any idea of uh, of exactly where Okeanos first described or first landed? Yeah, I think it described. Hmm. I know. Uh, yeah, they left the bottom from 408 meters. Pushing on the black coral there. Gotcha. Yeah, Jonathan, we've been following the Gokianos dive track great. on our way up here. But Roger. Kind of, it ended just before waypoint five, and so it did. We're on our own. Well, the true spirit of exploration. I like it. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, let's go find some good stuff. Okay, you can go ahead. Thanks. Chris Kelly. What type of fish is that? They did call this the, quote, 
Kona precious coral bed. Yes. So I'm really hoping we find some precious corals. That was a precious coral there, my friend. And more. I suppose this is a bed. I don't think you're going to see giant diverse coral up on the top here. It's too well. Uh, yeah, it's really. Out. Yeah. Bridge, bridge now. Do you have your downline zero on? at zero seven Sorry. zero, please? There you go. Thank you. Are you back up there? I still OBS is uh, frozen up here. I'll give you guys an update on this as soon as I <clears throat> confirm what. Okay, now yeah, we're messed up. Dead. Hmm. So Zach, did we go over what where we were expecting to find from the log? From the log? Yeah, from the previous dive. Oh, I that? thought you were referring to the log no, from sorry. the previous dive. <laughs> the previous dive. Uh, yeah, I mean, we scanned those depths. It seems like. Uh, yeah. yeah, they left bottom at 400 meters, so we're we're, we're already a little above. Than but okay. um, I mean. Depending on exact coordinates, if we're just off, I mean, who knows what might be up here. We've definitely found more of a patchy area. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a patch yeah. reef, though. You know, I wouldn't consider it a bed or anything well, of that once again, sort. But they seem to be looking for a very hard substrate, right? So when they yeah. have that calcium carbonate outcropping, they, you know, lots there. Yeah. And they also like to be, you know, up on the edges, right? Catch, catch all that food, catch everything coming by. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of um, of the gold coral there. That's definitely been the most common. The uh, Acanthogorgias. Zach, what did you say it's called? Uh, I believe they're um, our Acanthogorgian. Acanthogorgian? Yeah. I believe that like the large gold one there. More like Ecanther Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot argue that. I had to make sure I got the name right, otherwise the joke just wouldn't land. <laughs> So it looks like there is a little bit more coral there. Yeah, it looks like we've got, um, is that there to the left? Yeah, that Hilaria fish is there to the left again. Not worth uh, turning for or anything, but second time we've seen one of those guys.
It looks like we're coming up on. Oh no, I thought that was Hello, bamboo. Hello everyone. The back. This is Daniela. I'm back from dinner. Um, we have a question in the chat, Zach. Um, did we ever get an ID on that red spotted fish? You said it was a. Oh yes. Um, it I remember is. we did say it, Another right? Did you get a fish, common yeah. name for it though? Uh oh. I will look back for the common name. Uh -huh. Someone was asking it if it was a lizard fish. So I don't know if that's that fish, the uh, red and white one, or if there's one when I was yeah, having the, dinner. Yeah, the lizard fish. Um, spotted fish. Yeah, we had one fish that looked that it could be like in oh, the lizard not fish on SPL, family. Zach. No, you can't hear me. Hello, I can't hear you still. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. You can hear me, Dan. I can hear you, but you can't hear me. I can't hear Zach. Can you hear Zach? Can anybody hear me? I can kind of oh. hear Zach. You're a little low. Oh, I I'm, hear him. I'm just on my mic on SPL, but apparently my SPL was off. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so I wasn't your, on SPL. Your, your replacement didn't enjoy me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Turned me on mute. <laughs> I had everyone on mute, apparently. Look next. We're not oh. really seeing at all. But Much yeah, the lizard fish, I think when we zoomed in on that black coral, there was one that looked like it would be a lizard fish. Uh, the red one, though, definitely not a lizard fish. Let me see if I can find a common name for it. Um, one last thing before I go to dinner. The chat's letting us know they could hear us both. There was my end. <laughs> Apparently, I just had my mic on, but not my my ears. Yeah. <laughs> um, could be a pencil coffin fish. Pencil is, coffin. Is a that's quite a. Have. That's a good Halloween fish yeah. name for you. <laughs> I think I'd prefer the scientific name on <laughs> that fish. I'm gonna step out here quick though. Taylor Ann's gonna fill in for a minute. We have a question on how old you Although have we to head uh, forward towards whatever that is in front of Atalanta. Uh, yeah, I it should be bearing a four five. Sounds good. Bridge, bridge, now three zero at zero four five, please. So we have a question in the chat asking about how old you have to be. And I don't think there is necessary an age for the internships. Um, so yeah, I think as long, I mean, we have a 17 year old on board. So really, I don't think there's necessarily an age at the applications for these, for the 2024 season will open up at the end of October here so pretty soon keep an eye out i mean it is the end of october so yeah. it should be opening up any time now um but as far as i know and i'm looking at the website there is no age requirement here so might as well try you'll never get what you don't try for so speaking of that fish i believe we've got another one oh, sorry no Oh, another coffin fish? Pencil coffin fish, that's what Zach said, right? Taylor Ann, I have um, viewers asking if coffin or angel fish, and so they're kind of angel fish looking. Do you know anything on that? You know, I'm actually not too sure what that fish is. I'm I'm used to seeing uh, fish at deeper depths. So I know I'm all of us sure. are kind of this yeah. range is a little bit unknown. Yeah. Our depth is 387 meters at the moment. So we're kind of right at the the transition between our epipelagic zone and our mesopelagic zone here. And what's the difference? 
So epipelagic, think of epi as your skin, right? Your epidermis. So epi is your top layer. Yeah. And so in your epipelagic zone, this is where you still get sunlight. It's also called your photic zone. So in this area, you have your, your plankton, your phytoplankton. Um, it has your really high biodiversity due to that. Um, and a lot more variety and biodiversity of life. As you get deeper, you get less light. So you have more adaptations. Um, I think the animals start to get more interesting almost because they have to deal with harsher climates, right? You have your more niche species that have to deal with higher pressure, less light, more scarcity of food. Um, but the mesopelagic is kind of like your middle zone is also kind of referred to as your twilight zone. You have just a little bit of light sometimes in this area. And then after this, you get down. Um, so I always, I think of my acronym that a student helped me come up, well, I didn't actually, my student came up with, everyone must bathe at home. So after you have epipelagic, mesopelagic, then you have the bathypelagic, abyssal pelagic, and then Hadal pelagic, or hadal zone, not pelagic, but yeah. So. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank my student. So I think this thank might you be students. The, the Hawaiian spike fish. Hawaiian spike fish. Yeah, uh, the scientific name is Holardia goslinii. Is that in the same family related to? The coffin fish? Yeah, let's see, I'm not too sure. Simon, if you're still in a good position, I'll keep the ship moving in sure. this direction. Yep. Great. Oh, so a coffin fish looks very similar to uh, sea toads or tonicops. Bridge, nav, three zero so at I don't zero think four five, it. please. Um, the coffin fish, I think, would be an angler fish. Yeah, see. that's what someone was saying, is that the coffin fish are related to angler fish. Yeah. Yeah, they look similar to a chonicops. Yeah. So our anglerfish have that symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that's in their lure, kind of giving them that ability of photo, um, bioluminescence to attract their prey. Seeing a lot of car topography here. And then someone in the chat is saying the deep sea is usually colder and saltier too. And yes, that is true. We definitely get um, colder the deeper we go. We get down to about two degrees Celsius. So just below or just above freezing. We don't want the ocean to freeze and water has a high specific heat capacity that it keeps it from doing that. Um, but it definitely gets colder. So you can kind of feel this just by swimming. When you swim down, it starts to feel colder and colder. You go through those thermoclines as you go. And it does also increase in salinity as well. Simon, am I able to pester you with some ROV questions up there? Sure, go for it. I feel like we we talked a lot about biology, and yesterday we talked a lot about our camera systems. Can you tell me about different types of ROV? What makes Hercules different from other ROVs that you've driven? So, uh, yeah, in industry they're generally divided into uh, classes. So we have what we call observation class ROVs, which are uh, maybe about two feet in length by about a foot wide, uh, mainly used just for inspection purposes. So the oil and gas industry, the oil rigs and platforms have to undergo periodic inspection, the same as any other structure, but being subsea, we need to use an ROV for it. So we'll have a lengthy inspection program for those kinds of things. And then we'll use a, a small electric ROV for those. So electric thrusters and no hydraulic <coughs> circuitry on board generally won't use much tooling other than some uh, rudimentary <coughs> instruments to check for uh, protection on the frame, some anodes and that kind of thing. Then moving up, you have your like a larger observation class, um, 
some of those hydraulic, again, mostly electric. Uh, then you move on to like work class RVs, which are six to eight feet in length, maybe six feet wide by about six feet high, and they'll be hydraulically powered. So they'll be have a same as Hercules. They'll have a, an electric current uh, power going down, um, typically between two and a half thousand to up to six and a half thousand volts traveling down, and that will power an electric motor. Um, usually in industry, they're rated over 100 horsepower up to about 200 horsepower to use the various tooling that's needed in the subsea construction industry. They'll have the robotic arms, the same as Hercules has. Um, Hercules in itself, for the science community, they tend to not have uh, four, ac four axial thrusters. Uh, axial by, I mean, for um, horizontal navigation, you know, side to side, forwards, backwards, turning, etc. Um, a lot of science ROVs just have two thrusters at the back, and that enables, gives, it still gives the maneuverability, but also allows for um, closer viewing of um, fauna due to you won't get the same amount of water pushed around at the front of the ROV, which can disturb the fish and whatever you're trying to look at. So Hercules has two thrusters at the back to power us forward and in reverse, and then it also has two thrusters that run sideways across the body, which gives us our sideways movement that I'm doing now on with the ROV. Um, this will be, in industry ROVs, will generally be achieved by putting all four thrusters on an angle, um, because we're not particularly worried about disturbing sea life <laughs> in a close observation um, capacity. Uh, Hercules, again, has uh, industry standard hydraulic uh, manipulating arms uh, for taking samples and doing various other tasks that need to be done uh, subsea. So it's very similar in a lot of ways to a, a smaller work class vehicle. Bridge. Hercules has a 25 zero horsepower four five, please. hydraulic motor on board um, to power the thrusters, the arms, the um, sample trays, and the pan and tilt for the large camera that we're using for the main uh, pilot and viewing at the moment. Also, the, in the ROV, we'll have, um, again, much larger vehicles, but they'll run on tracks on the seabed. Um, we tend to call those uh, trenches, so subsea cables and pipelines uh, often get buried in the sediment so that they're protected from uh, fouling from ships' anchors and fishing activity and that kind of thing. And these trenches will dig a trench in front, they'll lay the pipe into the trench and then backfill it uh, as they move along. And what has been the longest ROV dive you've ever done in your career? So, uh, my personal record for the longest ROV dive was 34 days from launch to Ooh. recovery. <laughs> that is a long dive. <laughs> it was a very long dive indeed. Uh, typically we won't dive for that long, but um, it's not atypical for us to, in well, for the, in industry used to be down three, four days, five days, even a week if we're doing complex tasks in a, in a single area and the weather stays good. Um, yeah. Um, otherwise, we can do very short dives. If we've got a very small task to do, then the dive can be a matter of minutes to go down and place an object on the seabed and recover to uh, surface and move on and to the next place. So, so yeah. if it, any of our viewers are looking at a career in ROV, how does career prospects look? Are there a lot of jobs? This is a niche job. So there's very few ROV pilots around the world. Um, a statistic I saw several years ago uh, said there's around three and a half thousand worldwide. So there's probably more people work in Formula One or in NASA putting <laughs> things on the moon than there are ROV pilots around the world. And of that, the science community is another very small niche in within the very small number of pilots that there are. Um, if you think... So if someone tries to get a job in ROV pilots, working Nautilus science is very small. What are the other job fields that you work in as an ROV pilot? I know you talked about working in oil and gas. What else is there? So yeah, oil and gas is the, the main user of the remote um, submersibles. They used to use uh, divers for a lot of tasks starting now in the 70s and 80s. And then with the advance of technology, ROVs took over the work because they can stay in the water longer. You know, you're not putting someone's life at risk, um, etc. So they are the largest 
by far um, users of remote operated vehicles for uh, all their tasks. Uh, cable industries, you know, they'll have um, ROVs on board to monitor the, the laying down of cables onto the seabed. Um, so yeah, they're the, they're the main users and science is a, again a small portion of that. Thank you, Simon. TJ, what's like the main kind of thing that fails on an ROV? What's the thing that we always have to watch out the most for? I would uh, I would say electronics would be the would be the the biggest concern. Uh, electric electricity and water, uh, as everybody knows, is not a not a great combination. Yeah. Um, so and, uh, and then you add depth to it, uh, the outside factors uh, pushing in, outside forces pushing in, trying to get at it. So uh, yeah, your your electrics would be the the main areas getting worked on and uh, and getting repaired. Uh, definitely a background in electrical engineering and some form of electronics is uh, definitely a, a benefit in if somebody's interested in going into the ROV industry. The ROV team always seems really, really busy with Hercules before and after dives. What are things that you guys are checking over? How long does it take for you guys to go over your checks pre-dives and post-dives? So we, we would normally set a time of about four hours. Uh, sometimes that can be shorter and sometimes can be longer, uh, depending on, uh, on on what the next dive is. Uh, with an ROV, the ROV itself is a, is a platform, so it carries many different tools. Um, at the moment, we're carrying the cameras, and every time the ROV comes up, we, we change the configuration of the cameras, change the position of them uh, on board the ROV. Uh, that involves uh, the, the movement of the of the items themselves, the scientific equipment, but it also involves changing of ballast uh, to balance the ROV out, and also the the running of the the power supply or the the, the wiring to, that powers all this uh, equipment. So it, it takes some time, and then then you have your pre-dive checks po and post-dive checks after your dive uh, to make sure all the equipment is running correctly. Uh, that's done uh, meticulously every every time before every dive. So the chat has a question of, aren't quite a few ROV pilots cross-trained between NASA and Deep Sea? I can definitely see some connections between driving like the Mars rover and an ROV on the bottom of the Deep Sea. Um, <laughs> not so, I, I, I couldn't comment on the, on the NASA side of things. Uh, but yeah, uh, most uh, ROV pilots would be multi-skilled, uh, would carry a various uh, degree of different backgrounds. Like Simon comes uh, from the Air Force, uh, I myself, I was uh, offshore oil and gas, uh, a professional seafarer. Uh, last job I had prior to coming here, I was a submersible pilot. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, we come from uh, various different backgrounds. Do you, do you ever miss driving the subs? Uh, yeah, no, I still have uh, opportunities there in the future okay. uh, and, and, and at the moment. Um, but yeah, no, uh, really enjoying, uh, look, uh, enjoying what I'm doing right now. Um, the extra elbow great. room It was in great the to have that band. opportunity when I when I did do it. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is something that's uh, that's different and unique. Yeah. Um, it's uh, definitely uh, it gives you a chance to work with uh, with people that are that have uh, that are immersed in, in in the subject that they're studying. They have a great passion for what they do, and you can see that on a on a daily. Uh, in the daily jobs that are that take place in and out with the different scientists and uh, different engineers that come on, uh, they have a they have a fantastic passion for for the equipment they bring on board. Thank you. So, Chad, if any of you watching at home have any question for our, our amazing ROV pilots, please send them in. And when they're have some breaks between their technical moving, I'll pester them with them for you. It looks like we're getting into some coral now, though. Yeah, there's a big difference in yeah. just the next couple feet here of uh, coral. Yeah, so these pink to white coral fans we're seeing here are corallids. Uh, I believe the specific corallid that these are um, are Plerocorallium secundum. Um, and then the yellow fans we're seeing here are either zoanthid cover corals or acanthogorgia. Um, but we're mainly seeing a dominance of these cor uh, corallums here. 
Uh, I think, th and these are the precious corals that they were talking about in those dive reports. Yes, I think coral fans are just so beautiful. They really are. All right, I'm gonna pass it on over back to Zach. I have a question in a chat. Why are these corals to corals? Is that bleaching? Um, I think if you're meaning that like some of the corals are going from red to white, white doesn't always necessarily mean bleaching. Um, a lot of our corals have this symbiotic relationship um, with the algae called zooxanthellae, and the algae is what gives coral our colors. So if you notice the white on the tips, a lot of times that's just the new growth of the coral and their zooxanthellae have not moved into those tips yet to really give them that color. So sometimes it is bleaching, but if you see it overall on the tips kind of thing, that's a good sign that that's just the new growth of the coral. If it's bleaching, it tends to be a little bit more spotty patches, might be like one entire limb of the coral is white. All right. We have Jonathan back in the van here. Hello, everyone. All right. How's Triclops doing, Jonathan? So I'll give everyone an update here. This is a great lesson in um, no matter how hard you plan and no matter how hard you keep looking, you'll always find something else you didn't expect. Our uh, camera system, Triclops, is uh, our three cameras in a very nice deep water housing. Um, and we've been having them take a photograph every three seconds. Well, it turns out that although most cameras uh, will naturally roll over at 10,000 images, 9,999 images, all three of these cameras saw 9,999 and could not conceive of what 10,000 might look like. <laughs> so we have a camera system inside the bottles. We, they're still turned on, but they're not able to take the photographs um, that we need them to. So um, we're gonna modify this plan um, using Zeus. This will increase the amount of time that we'll need to complete a nice square survey of this area. Um, we're gonna have to run kind of n more narrow uh, passes back and forth. Um, but since we have finally gotten up here and, and, and this really meets the, the core expectations of our partners as far as uh, good diversity on good rocky substrate. Um, I'd like to continue forth and we're gonna use Zeus for this uh, survey. So um, I think the first question that I have for, for NAV and the ROV team is uh, trying to estimate the amount of time that it would take uh, to um, complete a boxed survey where we're going back and forth to get 100% coverage, we're mowing the lawn um, of about a 50 to f by 50 meter, um, a 50 by 50 meter search pattern grid that is uh, square on all sides for something like this. It'll have to be a very systematic survey with at least 50% overlap. Um, so a little harder to gauge with just Zeus, but you guys have thoughts on this, on, on how to set up given, given the terrain around here? Uh, can, uh, consistent standoff height, not depth, so delta from bottom. And probably about what we're seeing here right now, or whatever you think you'd be comfortable with uh, to go as fast as possible.
okay? And uh, what do we think about time and uh, tether management for that kind of idea of about a 50 by 50 meter? Is this going to be something that requires repeated ship moves back and forth or? Okay. And Zach, from your seat, is this a, a pretty good spot from uh, considering the, the rest of the terrain I might have missed while I was out? Oh yeah, definitely. This is the most uh, abundance for sure. Before okay. we were just getting kind of like isolated rocks that would be covered and that was All it. Right. So this is the first like um, bed, I would say. But that's awesome. So, um, I would love the idea, as you said, to whatever whatever you think is the best survey grid. This the the idea of fifty meter by fifty meter is 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 an arbitrary number. I think the goal is as large coverage as is reasonable to get uh, with the time remaining during this dive. So, uh, uh, Simon and Nav, um, if you guys think that um, a, a, like less than that, to so that you can not minimize the amount of ship moves. I'd be happy to accept that if we can maybe get a measurement of what the tether constrains us to for this particular grid pattern. Um, does that make sense? Okay. One, one thing before we get super started is um, I have a, on the front porch there, uh, I have a reference target, uh, which is a little piece of angle iron uh, or angle aluminum that uh, I'd like to get set up somewhere in the middle of whatever this uh, grid pattern will look like. Um, we'll want to start with doing a nice easy um, spin around that target and then we can start the grid pattern um, and start mowing the lawn. Roger. All right, so just to give our viewers an update, because of our um, triclop system down, we're trying to think of a, a backup plan of how we want to survey our corals of this coral garden that we've now reached. And so we're repositioning Hercules and Atalanta, and we're gonna set up a grid system. So bear with us as we reconfigure our systems here. Well, and, and from from our perspective, like again, if we can, if you just want to run radials around wherever Atalanta's currently dropped to avoid any ship moves, I'd also be happy to do that because then we can just move the ship after we have a smaller box completed. Now that's pretty good. Yeah, this seems nice and flat too. Not a whole lot of change in the, topo in the topography there. Is it right to chat while you guys are figuring this out, or should I keep quiet? I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. I couldn't hear that. Oh, uh, <laughs> chat, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can carry on. We have SBL turned off up here uh, okay. while we're discussing this. All right. All right. So, Zach, I have a question then for you. Um, do corals naturally like flatter ground than rock outcrops? 
flatter ground than rock outcrops? Uh, I, I mean, think the viewers are saying because we kind of came up to this area where we saw these coral yeah. flan, fan, fans and it was mm -hmm. nice and flat. I think it depends on the species of coral, really. Yeah, and, and we're on like the top of a hill, right? And so when we saw them coming on the rocks before, they were they were settling on those large rocks where they were kind of getting elevation off the bottom too, right? So like they're on the bottom right now, but it's the top of this entire, like this little seamount area that we're in. Um, so yeah, I think they just go wherever they can like maximum the amount of like food and everything that's coming by, right? If, yeah. If they're buried deep, it's going to go right over their head. Um, so not ideal. And um, there's usually good, you know, flow of water over that too and everything. So. And but I think, I think coral fans are a little bit more fragile, right? So yeah. they don't like an environment with a high current area. Whereas earlier when we're kind of coming up this seamount, we on the edge, we saw on the rock outcropping, so the rock gives a substrate for the coral to attach to, mm -hmm. and you see more of the soft corals there with yeah. the higher current. Yeah, that's the same for like near shore um, corals too. Um, here in Hawaii, you don't see a lot of those soft corals just because it's so exposed, right, in all directions. Um, we have like a, a small little octo coral that, that grows in like shallow in the tide pools and things, but it's it's more like a base layer almost. It looks like it's just covering the rocks. It's not these large soft corals yeah. um, kind of flowing in the water column. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, corals are quite diverse they in many are. ways, right? And that hard and soft body is, is one of the big ones, obviously. What is like the average life expectancy for corals? Do you know any like in particular off the top of your head? <laughs> Old. old. <laughs> They're yeah, very old. Very old. Very slow growing and very old. Do, um, do hard corals live longer than soft corals or vice versa? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. If I, I had to guess, either. I would say a hard coral lives longer as long as it doesn't get broken or yeah. you know eaten. But the thing is, there's there's a lot of coralivores on the reef, right? That target corals as food. Yeah. Um, and and that could be good and bad. Obviously, there's a balance there, right? Um. The herbivores are really what's more important for corals, keeping the algae off of them and things like that. Right? Yes. Like the corals don't have a whole lot of self-defense. Um, so herbivores are really important um, to keeping healthy coral. And co corals are really important to our um, ecosystems because they tie up a lot of the nutrients in the coral themselves so that it keeps that algae from right. growing too much. And then animals eat the corals. And so it's kind of all part of the cycle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, um, let's see. And someone in the, in the chat commented that it's uh, definitely not true of the corals liking the flat ground and deep sea corals. And I definitely agree with that because they do like those vertical surface because they get that high current, makes it for more food sources for them. Yeah. But once we get up into this top of the sea mound where you have that high, that nutrients coming, pushing up off the, due to the upwelling, you get different types of corals here. And that's why we all of a sudden now see those sea fans that we did not see growing up along the side. Yeah. <coughs> What's your favorite kind of coral, Zach? Hmm. Uh, I really like the mushroom corals, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, especially the ones on the reef. They're just they're kind of so unique, and yeah. and and you gotta kind of look for them compared to you know the branching corals that stand out to you. Um, yeah, I always I always like finding and seeing those mushroom corals. What about you? Hmm. My favorite coral. It's been a while since I thought of this. Um, I have a couple mushroom corals as my paperweights in my classroom. Yeah, they make I don't have AC, so oh. I have my windows open, wind blowing, so I use coral. Yeah. And, um, hmm, favorite coral. I like Gorgonian fans. I think they're just so yeah. beautiful. Um, someone in the chat asked, what was with all the grenadier fish yesterday? And if we ever figured out why there were so many of them, I don't think so, not yet. We're probably sending our footage and our data, making those models, sending them to our scientists. So it'll take a little time for us to maybe figure if any scientists on shore have any feedback and want to send that in to us on the chat, be happy to share it. But as of right now, nothing um, 
conclusive on that, I believe. Yeah, if I had to bet, I would bet it's some type of mating thing. Because oh, okay. um, when we see those fish, typically they're kind of out on their own, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of is similar to other species like groupers on the reef. You don't really see schools of groupers, but groupers are also known to get together for like mass spawning events. And you saw some of those individuals swimming up towards each other and brushing against each other. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of kind of that process. So I don't know that for certain, but if I had to guess, that that's where I would put my money on. But I think that was a first for the for the Nautilus to see that, too. That I don't think great. anybody had seen the school of those together. No, so it's very cool. And it is kind of full moon right now. So, it, you know, yeah. fish do things with the moon. So. And, Zach, can you tell us how the full moon affects corals? Ooh, um, from what I believe, it, uh, it's kind of a spawning event for them. Yeah. Yeah, they, I think they spawn on full moons. Is, is it full moon? It right? is. And I yeah. think it's only, like, it's like once a year too isn't it yeah. it's I, I forget which full moon it is yeah. um but there's a certain time of year yeah. i actually got to experience a coral spawning off the great barrier reef when oh, i was nice. working out yeah. there yeah and then it's like you you dive in you're like oh my god this is so cool and then you come up and you're like oh you realize what you're covered in yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it gets really murky at the surface yes, yeah, it's, it it does. you just can't see through anything and, and you just think like, it's a blur but you're like was this as good yeah. of an idea as i yeah. thought it was originally <laughs> well and, and now that people are starting to get a better idea of when they spawn and you know what moons and everything they at least on here on hawaii island they do close a couple of the bays for that coral spawning so it's not disturbed and it can do its thing naturally um, which i think is awesome you know that's yeah. one of those things we learn that might as well take care of them in any way we can. And and people, you know, even like the ocean users and goers, um, they, they totally understand. And it's it's one of those, it's it's a it's a win for the corals for sure. And the coral spawning is not just important for the corals, but all ecosystems because it's a valuable food source for a lot of our animals yeah. as well. And just giving you guys a update at home, our ROV pilots and our navigators are still trying to come up with the plan on how we are going to survey this area without our Triclops camera system. Yeah, and what they're about to do is is not really the the way we've been we've been doing the photogrammetry dives. This is going to be very similar to as if uh, a human was out there diving, doing it, just kind of going back and forth, turning and mowing the lawn. Uh, we've been doing a lot of kind of vertical faces. Yeah, it's kind of been like the, the focus this trip, but you know, finding this bed, I think uh, Dan can agree, this is a chance we can't pass up. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, this is what we were looking for. So yeah, that's we found what, it. this is what the whole point yep. of this dive was for, is to see this coral garden up here. And really what photogrammetry allows us to do is um, put this together in a big model. So we can see where all the corals, what this different species were. You'll be able to see how, you know, estimate of how tall it is, um, general shapes and colors, right? So essentially, as we see now, we're only seeing just a portion of it. And as we just survey the entire thing, um, it'll just lay out and say, here's the entire, here's the entire patch. And then they can determine how many corals, what type of corals, what they're living on, what substrates. Um, and really, you know, scientifically dissect why this is a great place compared to everything else that we've seen, yeah. which is very sparse. Yeah. So something here has to be, you know, feeding them or, you know, providing good life. It, you know, there's could be a reason that they're choosing to make this their home. Yeah. So normally we've been just kind of doing, coming across the face of the cliff and working our way up on a, you know, but now what we'd like to do a zigzag pattern and, uh, you know, really, you know, plot this area in a methodical way. So they're just going to take a need a couple of minutes here to set this up. They're drawing it out, um, looking at the contours because I can see them here on the screen and then they'll be off and going.
One of our viewers is saying they wish they could do a lawnmower pattern on that huge coral field they found out in Midway and Johnson Atoll. And I agree, that would be really cool. There was a lot of biodiversity out there. So who knows, maybe in a future uh, Nautilus expedition, they might take uh, triclops out there and um, 3D image it and use our lawnmower technique. Didn't we come up with a, we had a new word for it. I already forgot it. Oh, I did too. It was, <laughs> uh, it was too long of a word. My, I have a terrible short-term memory. I'm like Dory. <laughs> All right, so Zach, you and I are the Hawaii residents here. I don't want to say locals, but residents. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our viewers, if they come to Hawaii and they want to see some corals, they're not going to be able to really get to these depth of these corals. Where do you recommend for them to go snorkeling and get some good good mm. cor coral views? I would say mm, it's a hard one. I don't, you know, finding good corals and finding good reefs, that takes time, you know. And... Um, yeah, a lot of it is just kind of putting the work in and trying different places. Um, well, what a about Kanaloe Bay? Which one? Was it Kanaloe Bay? Uh, it's like a volcano. It's a volcano that oh, sort of. Oh, um, Molokini? Is off that? of Maui? No, by in, in Oahu. On Oahu? Yeah. Kaniola Bay. Uh, Ka there's Kaniohe Kani Bay. There, but yeah, no, Kaniohe Bay isn't very good snorkeling. It yeah. has um, a lot of. It's usually pretty bad visibility. Pretty dirty. Yeah, it's pretty dirty. Yeah. Um, so a lot of inconspicuous sea cucumbers, which are the <laughs> ones that I just think it's a funny name, but they're like these look like giant white yeah. worms. It's funny. And that's one of the most common um, students will always go out to the Kaneohe sandbar. Yeah. And then they'll be like, Miss, what is this I saw? And bring a picture of They're them long, me. too. Yeah, they those can things get stretch really so long. long. They're kind of creepy. But their feeding appendages are cool. Yeah, yeah they, they have look those like those feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on Oahu, um, Hanama Bay is a popular one. Hanama Bay is protected, um, natural resource. It does get a lot of foot traffic, though. Yeah. So if you go to Hanama Bay, please don't stand on the coral, folks. That's like number one rule. They even make you watch this video. But no matter how many times you watch that video and how many times you tell people, every time I've gone, I see people standing on the uh, coral. So we're really yeah. looking to just go over this patch here. Um, and where you see the biggest coral density, and he just wants to be able to see, um, Jonathan really like us just be able to have 50% overlap on Zeus's cameras, right? So another place I really like to snorkel though is Electric Beach off of Oahu. Zach, have you yeah, I think that's that's the first test I see I from not, that. So go ahead and fly around it so that he can get color matching and range from it. Yeah, I honestly haven't dove off of Oahu. I've done all my diving around Big Island, and yeah. I've kind of explored every every tip and point that I could out here. Um, yeah, and it's the Big Island is very different everywhere you go. It um, is. But yeah, it's. I don't know, it's one of those things where, um, yeah, if you're going to come to a new place and you're going to you're gonna enjoy it, make sure you do it respectfully. Um, make sure you go to places that are um, welcoming. There's certain areas that are, are protected that you may not know, so do your research ahead of time, especially for that. Um, yeah, and then and when you are in the water, um, enjoy it, but just, yeah, be respectful and be aware of, of where you are and um, yeah, be lucky to be there. <laughs> well, Zach, um, yeah. I hope you know that once we got a get off the ship, I'm going to be calling you up to take me diving around the big <laughs> island. I've got a, I got a couple spots, All but right. can't put them out there to the and whole world. And if you come to Oahu, I'll take you to my secret spots on Oahu <laughs> as well. Good to know. Yeah, so as this is going, the main thing you're, you're going to notice is the, the pilots are going to try to maintain the same height from the bottom the entire time. So 
if there's a change in, in the height of, of the actual benthic environment, they'll go up with a little bit. Because um, for the for the photogrammetry models, that, that height from the bottom is very important, more so than um, them staying at a fixed depth. Uh, so you might see them go up and down a little bit. I mean, otherwise their goal is to go as straight as possible, which with an ROV, this is a, this is a masterful skill. Um, so this is going to be impressive to, to, to enjoy watching them make these straight lines and these these uh, these effective turns to get everything in there. Um, the turns are often the, the problem spots in models just because you, you go farther than you mean to, um, even just diving. So, um, yeah, we'll sit back and enjoy this maneuvering because this is, this is going to be great, and uh, hopefully we can get a, a great large model out of this one. So in the chat, I did see a couple questions for the ROV pilots, but they're currently busy right now. So if we have time later on, we'll circle back to them. Yeah. But for right now, we're going to let them concentrate on driving this pattern for us here. Yeah, we call it mowing the lawn, but it is not nearly as easy <laughs> as mowing the lawn. <laughs> Sometimes you just push the lawnmower and goes on its own. You yeah. know, you just go straight. Whereas down here, we have a lot of currents, different forces pushing and pooling on those ROVs, making it yeah. very difficult to drive straight. All right, I'm back. Welcome back, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Simon, how, uh, how are we doing here, Dan? Everybody? Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, um, uh, pretty simple. I think that we just uh, place this where you think is uh, the best spot. Um, it's just a 4x4 uh, uh, four four triangle. Um, we'll do a quick spin around it and then set up the survey lines as, as, you, as you advise. Jonathan, for our viewers, can you give them an update from what the ROV pilot just said? Yeah, so um, we're looking, we've been searching through this, uh, uh, this entire dive for um, an area of high density corals to do a photogrammetry survey of. Um, we're here at the top of the sea mound and have found a really nice spot following what appears to be a uh, ridge line of slightly harder substrate. I'm seeing some stand question mark sand on the right hand side and some kind of fields that aren't aren't as heavily populated. Yeah, yeah, some hard structure there they can grab yeah, on really to. Grab on to. Yeah. So. Um, what we're going to start this uh, uh, survey off of is is with a known reference, um, and in this case, this known reference is that uh, item you can see on the porch. Really simple. It's an item of known dimensions and a known volume. Um, we're going to place that on the seabed so that we have something that we can um, record and make um, corrections off of for the final model. And uh, so once they place that, we're going to do a quick spin around it, um, scan it with scan it for photogrammetry, and then we're going to continue on with the survey. Um, and that survey is going to be essentially like uh, you have a 30 by 30 meter lawn, and you are just going back and forth because you want to cut every single one of those. Uh, hence mowing the lawn. Hence mowing the lawn, yeah. The goal here is to make sure that we get um, about 50% coverage as you're going back and forth between each one of the lines. Okay. Um, that way, when you're actually constructing the model, it will um, achieve what's called cohesion. So like each one of the elements of the model will all fit together. Um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, so are we gonna pick this item up, this, this known dimension block? Yeah. Are we placing it once and then do we place it multiple times, or is it just one nope. time? It, it we'll just place it this one time here in the middle. Okay. Um, the the amount of space, like if we were doing this over a much larger 
uh, area than just, you know, about 50 meters square, then yeah, you would want to continue okay. to put down some known control points, but in this instance, it's really quite unnecessary. Okay. And so for a little data for those watching at home, our depth right now for Hercules is 383 meters and the water temperature is 9.11 degrees Celsius and oxygen is at 25% saturation. And salinity, if anyone really cares about salinity, is 34.2 PSU. All right, so someone in the chat has asked, what is the strangest or creepiest thing you've seen on a dive? So seeing as we're getting closer to Halloween, Jonathan, what's the strangest or creepiest thing you've seen on a dive? Mm. Well, I've got to think about that one. Sea spider. Sea spider. Yeah, sea spider is pretty good, Dave. That's a good one. Sea spiders are a really interesting organism. They're kind of a living fossil. They're related to our um, horseshoe crabs. They're in a similar family. Well, if you want to, the only thing, the only thing more creepy, if you don't like spiders, is two sea spiders. <laughs> <laughs> so, if 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 anyone listening is on there, uh, well, of course, everyone's on YouTube. Uh, you can go ahead and Google uh, uh, um, sea spiders matching pores, uh, which was a, essentially we had run across two sea spiders that were mating, which was actually very novel um, behavior to, to see uh, um, a sea sp uh, actual sea spider biologist. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm forgetting their name, actually reached out to us and said, you know, this is an incredible sighting. Um, these are very rarely seen. But I'll tell you what, it, it was it was pretty creepy. Like because instead of instead of just like the eight legs, no, it was it was a full up full tamale of sixteen and you didn't know where one body was and one body ended. And it they, was, they, they were have just all their organs in their legs too, don't they? Yeah, no, they were just yeah, tapping those just little legs all around, like you didn't know what was going on. It was it was a thing. Yeah, thank you, Dave. That was definitely right on there. <laughs> So for those watching, this is pretty cool. Trying to a nice view of Herc's arm, trying to grab that block and place it on the substrate for us. Look at that. Just the perfect touch. Perfect. Yes. <clears throat> Someone in the chat disagrees with us, though. They don't think sea spiders are creepy. They think they're kind of cute. I, yes, <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> I don't know, the proboscis along with those legs. There's, there's a lot of limbs going on. A lot of legage. Very leggy animals. Well, last night we had, when, during recovery, we had the black ink that oh, came yeah, down we got all over again. Zeus's camera, yeah. and that was kind of scary. All yeah. of a sudden, blue, 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 black. Um, I love our footage of the vampire squid. That'd be a really cool thing to see. Yeah, and that's Especially beautiful. around Halloween time when it's floating through the water like that. It definitely looks like a vampire. So someone's asking if the, instead of, having happy time spiders, if they were actually eating each other. Maybe they're like mantas, you know, like the... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> spiders are known for that on land. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. the female killing the male. But sea spiders are not actual spiders. Right. They're not yeah. arachnids. Sorry, Jonathan. So there's Go ahead, Simon. Uh, J Jonathan, just to confirm, we can leave the, the dual cameras that are on the tool tray. They can be left retracted in now for the rest oh, of the Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can secure those. Thank you. Um, and just as far as uh, Zeus, Dave, um, if we can keep Zeus at just a single um, zoom setting, 
for this entire dive, as wide as is reasonable. Actually, I already, that's perfect right there. And, yep, that's um, full wide without showing vignetting. I thank you so much. Um, and then uh, no no additional tilting, please, Simon of uh, Zeus, if we can if we can get away with it for this uh, survey. Just for anyone looking, this is uh, uh, 12 inches long, and each one of those flats is four inches. Um, and it's going to establish a baseline measurement for the photogrammetry and structure and motion workflows that we're going through. So someone in the chat said vampire squids are scary looking, but they're filter feeders. Is that true? Are vampire squids filter feeders? I don't think uh, most squids, squids usually yeah. are not filter feeders. So, but we'll have Zach on the, the Google. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. If anyone else in the chat wants to chime in, if they know about the feeding habits of vampire squids or not, feel free. Yeah, it says they are filter feeders. They're I would have never feeders. guessed that. I never, I mean, I've never heard of squid I like this altitude, Simon. Feeds. Yeah. Yeah, about, about two meters is perfect, it looks like. We have to kind of balance the total resolution, so I need to be able to like read numbers. And someone else is chiming in that they think the creepiest deep sea creature is the basket star. They can, like, with all their arms, I can see how they can come off a little creepy, but I don't know. They're still star yeah. fit. Uh, like, they almost look a little wormy, I guess. You know what yep. do you, uh, what animals actually always giving me the heebie-jeebies? Uh, sea snakes. Yeah. But I think I've just had a very bad experience as a child with a snake, so mm -hmm. I was living in Guam and one crawled into my bed and tried to eat my hand, so. Ooh, <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> I was diving in Australia and saw sea snakes and snakes yeah. give me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. So that's mine. That's my answer, sea snakes. Yeah. Luckily, we do not have sea snakes yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah, here in Hawaii, we are the, uh, some people joke about the animals being like similar to Australia. They just don't kill you here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we just don't even have sea snakes in general. We oh, look, hermit There's crab. A big hermit crab. Um, Saying hello. Just checking out that new home right over there we put down. <laughs> about to trade shells? Yeah. Oh, no. We might not get it back now. Yeah, he definitely wins that exchange. <laughs> We do have in Hawaii the cone snail, which yep. is toxic. Mm -hmm. Has a very powerful sting. So if you've ever seen a cone snail, recommend not to pick it up or at least check and make sure that no one's still living in it. Roger. So a good indicator that nothing is living in a cone snail is if you see sand inside the edge because the animal would keep that clear. Yeah, yeah. I think cone snails actually cause like a surprising number of deaths a year throughout the world because people will put them like in their pocket and or like in their top it, and not yeah. know. It. And the proboscis just hits them like right in the femoral artery or like right in the chest, and it, and it's it gets you quick. Like especially the ones over Australia region, they're even more. Yeah, I he I've heard something like statistics of like five seconds. Yeah. Surprised it, anyone in Australia who goes outside. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we have any viewers from Australia watching in with us right now. And we do. We have one from Australia listening in. So feel free well. to chime in on your thoughts of <laughs> all the poisonous animals. I lived in Australia for a year, though, and I managed not to die. So It's pretty solid. <laughs> I consider it a solid goal in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Did so you go outside? <laughs> I did go outside, oh. yes. Yeah. I worked as a dive guide for a little bit out there. Hey, Dave. And a marine biologist go taking Dave. people what's out your, of uh, the river. What's your estimate of uh, the angle of Zeus right now? 
about 45 or yeah something like that I can't really tell um, I don't have a good gauge on that yeah I was looking when when Atlanta was circling around it looked like it must be about 45 one viewer is saying they think oh yeah thank you so much great idea They think the creepiest sea creature is the horseshoe crab. Yeah, if crab. you can line those lasers up right next to the uh, fiducial, that'd be great. The horseshoe crab. Yeah, but they used hey. to step on them when they're swimming in Santa oh. Cruz. Do you know what a, a horseshoe crab and an octopus have in common? Blue blood? Yeah, yeah. they both have the hemocyanin in their blood. Yeah. So the hemoglobin. Do you think but it's, so horseshoe crabs are used, um, are critically, I think, I don't know, actually critically endangered, but they're endangered. Yeah, I'm not actually, sure. Actually, I'm starting to second guess myself on that yeah. one. But I know they're used in a lot of medical research yeah. Yeah. because of their blue blood. Yep. Yeah, I think it's much easier to get their blue blood out than an octopus. I was going to say, <laughs> it's like if octopus have blue and yeah. it's their immune system, though, that is the reason. So I don't, I that, don't that think. they're researching it? Yeah, because yeah. the horseshoe crabs are a living fossil, right? They haven't yeah, changed right. so much in so long. So their immune system is very sensitive, and that's what's allowed them to live for so yeah. long. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering if that's a different thing, and the octopus may not have that sensitive of immune system, even though they both share that blue blood. Yeah. Yeah, and horseshoe crabs Thank you so also, much, guys. Um, they're not even, uh, I mean, they obviously are related to crabs of some sort, but they're not crustaceans either. No, that's they're kind not. Of cool they're, they're, I think, closer related to our Can you mark uh, lasers spider. off? Uh, oh, that looks cool. That's always cool. Lasers on. Cool. Yeah, they're a member of the Chelicerata is the uh, subfam subphylum or family. I'm not sure what it is. So a lot of our viewers yeah. are commenting in about our cone snails. Um, and that they definitely are one of the most dangerous sea creatures out there. Good idea, Dave. And one so did make the correction for me that they are venomous, not poisonous. And yes, that <laughs> is, a, I, always, I always swap the two, but there is, is a difference. I think that this is fine. Um, I'm gonna just estimate at 45. It doesn't have to be an exact. So I'd say if we can uh, settle around to the two meter flight height and uh, yeah, I can't quite see it. Are the downs on? Yeah. It's okay. We'll probably catch it on our way back. Yeah. Um, yeah, two two meter survey height, um, as straight lines as possible. We're trying to target about a 50% overlap, which of course is gonna be difficult, but uh, we'll just do do our best. Yeah. We have Jason chiming in with a weird fact that horseshoe crab, that some people actually eat horseshoe crab blood. Yeah. That is that is a weird fact. Hmm. So thank you for that weird fact, Jason. I will add it to my arsenal. Yeah, I don't know what to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, here's a question for you. Since um, we're not using the new camera system triclops and we're using Herc Zeus instead, is the final results on the photogametry going to be different than the previous dives resolution wise? That's a great question. And the answer is that no, it doesn't have to be different resolution wise. Um, the wide field of camera array allows you to do it faster. Um, and it does take images at seven times uh, a great deal more resolution in terms of like the actual image. Um, the, the sensor on Zeus is uh, um, uh, HD uh, and the sen each individual sensor in the wide field camera array is uh, it's like a 6K, which is 
again, uh, four times as much 4K. So um, if you'd think that that really does make a huge difference in something like the total resolution of a final file, but there's an additional way to get resolution, and that is to take more images um, and stack them up. So in the case of what we're going to be doing with Zeus trying to fly a little bit faster, um, because we have a lower resolution, I'm going to put feed more uh, data into the model. I'm going to put more images into the model, and, and we should achieve a pretty good resolution in the final result. Um, again, the, the challenge of this survey without the wide field camera array really is going to be that we actually achieve coverage that overlaps on each one of the lines. Um, that's that's, a, that's a, a difficult problem, even with fantastic piloting, um, just given the resolution of our um, capacity to know where the vehicles are um, this deep down in the ocean. There's kind of an inherent um, fuzziness in, in um, some of the positional elements um, of doing a survey, or following a dive track, sorry. So we had someone in the chat asking if horseshoe crabs can regrow their legs. And yes, they do have regenerative and ability. Simon, I did just want to clarify in terms of mowing the lawn, it would be oh, what we'll need to do is actually come back on the exact same path that we left so that essentially we can image the other side of a coral, if that makes sense. So. We're not, we're not like going down to the end and then scooting over five meters and then coming back. We need to go down to the end and come back on the same line and then scoot over five meters and then keep going. Because we're, we're really looking for that kind of 360 degree coverage of, of each coral. Thank you. What direction did you uh, line out? Starting in the northwest corner, you said? Okay. Zach, we have a question in the chat. If this yellow coral we're seeing is Hawaiian gold coral. Um, yeah, I'll have to look into that. Uh, Hawaiian gold coral sounds yes. like it's... Uh, Fairly vague. It could include a lot of gold coral species. It looks um, pretty similar to the picture that I pulled up yeah. on here. Yeah, I wouldn't say no. Um, Apparently, Hawaiian second. gold coral is used to make jewelry. And its qualities are similar to tiger's eye. Yeah, precious corals uh, have been used for jewelry for quite a while, um, especially before people really understood how precious they were. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure in some areas they're still harvested, but just perfect, Simon. Yeah, perfect altitude, speed, pacing, everything. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tune out for a minute, Daniela. Make sure I got all the notes during this pass. Sounds good. So I have a comment in the chat asking that they're saying that they know we've all been focused on the ocean, but if we've been to the summit of Mauna Kea, I have definitely been to the summit of Mauna Kea several times when I've, I live on Oahu, but I've come over to the big island a few times and I do highly enjoy watching the sunset from up there and the stars. I also like the fact that you can go and build a snowman, play in the snow and then go down the beach and warm up. I don't know if anyone else from our um, Cruise has been had the chance yet um, to go over. Most of us fly in and out of Oahu, so we're kind of skirting along the edge. Zach's from the Big Island, but um, yeah. So it is. I agree with you though. That is definitely a bucket list destination. So everyone should, if you come all the way out to Hawaii, head on over to the Big Island and check out Mauna Kea. 
but also be very respectful because it is a sacred place to um, indigenous Hawaiian practitioners. And then Jason, I do think that we have